and welcome to Autocracy Now. As part of our series on Stalin, this is Episode 8, Before the Storm. On the 23rd of August 1939, the airport in Moscow had been emblazoned with swastikas, the symbol that had become synonymous with both Nazi Germany and with anti-Semitism and racial hatred. An orchestra was playing the German national anthem, which had now become synonymous with fascism. This was no act of sabotage, of the kind that Stalin and his police force had persecuted so many individuals for in previous years. Instead, they were rolling out the red carpet for a very important diplomatic guest, Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister. He arrived at 1pm. By 2am, the great treaty he had arrived in Moscow to sign was ready. This was a staggeringly quick turnaround when you consider that the treaty not only ensured that Nazi Germany and the USSR would cooperate economically and refrain from attacking each other militarily, but also included a secret protocol that divided all of Eastern Europe, and, amongst it, the lives and destinies of millions of people, between Nazi Germany and the USSR. Stalin was very happy to negotiate terms with Hitler. He was thrilled to obtain Eastern Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, and parts of Romania as his sphere of influence, while Hitler took the rest of Poland and Lithuania. Just like that, the violent overthrow of these governments was guaranteed. He even proposed a toast to Hitler, saying, quote, He's a good chap, I'd like to drink to his health. End quote. Yet there were reservations to his effusive and glowing praise for Hitler and the Nazis. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, as this treaty was called, can only be interpreted as another one of Stalin's tactical plays. It's not the case that he genuinely hoped that the USSR and Nazi Germany could have a lasting peace where they'd each stick to their own spheres of influence and unite against the liberal democracies that both viewed with deep suspicion. When Ribbentrop proposed that the treaty describe in detail German-Soviet friendship, Stalin was hardly amused. He said, quote, For many years now our propaganda boys have been pouring shit over each other's heads. Now, all of a sudden, are we to make our people believe that all is forgiven and forgotten? Behind the scenes of the negotiations, Stalin's confidence in his chess-playing ability was revealed. At a dinner with some of his inner circle comrades, he'd boast, It's all a game to see who can fool whom. I know what Hitler's up to. He thinks he's outsmarted me, but actually it's I who's tricked him. After all, Nazis and communists had been bitter, vitriolic enemies for years, for as long as the ideologies had existed, almost. The Nazis swept to power, democratically elected power at least at first, at least in part through fear of communism. It had been demonising communists, and blaming them for the Reichstag fire, that had allowed Hitler to seize complete control over the fledgling democratic institutions in the Weimar Republic. The Russian people, and Slavic people more generally, were considered subhuman in Hitler's racist ideology. For Stalin's part, the endless set of charges that the NKVD had drawn up against his enemies had always included the charge of being a fascist spy. They had done more than pour shit over each other's heads politically. People had been imprisoned and murdered en masse. For the slightest hint of a collusion with these foreign powers, you could not imagine two more diametrically opposed powers. And in a lot of ways it made the liberal democracies complacent. They thought, well, Stalin and Hitler hate each other evidently, they'll just be at each other's throats and we'll be free to pursue our own interests without worrying about a war with them. But now, these two greatly opposed powers were working together to carve up the world. The liberal democracies had been negotiating with Stalin in ambivalent peace talks that had only concluded a few days before, but it was clear that here they'd been beaten to the punch, and there was widespread surprise. Even Imperial Japan, Germany's allies in the war, had not been informed. Now, they were engaged in this on-off border war with the USSR, which, you know, this stretches back all the way to 1905 and before with the Russo-Japanese War, so diplomatically it's obvious why Germany wouldn't tell Japan that they were negotiating but it just shows that it came as a surprise to everyone if they didn't even tell their allies. The Nazi tactic of Blitzkrieg, moving quickly enough that your enemies are constantly thrown off balance, was at play in the diplomatic sphere. But what game was Stalin playing? In some ways, he might have felt that the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was his only option. Stalin instinctively felt that he could make a deal with Hitler in order to focus his attentions on Britain and France. Although Hitler's rhetoric had always insisted that communism had to be destroyed, Stalin calculated that the German people would be more concerned with gaining revenge on France and Britain for the humiliating Treaty of Versailles 
Therefore, if Stalin was willing to make the territorial concessions that Germany was demanding, they could strike a deal. It's also important to remember that we look on this era with the benefit of hindsight. No one really knew how much of what Hitler was saying was rhetoric, although seizing Austria and Czechoslovakia made it obvious that he was willing to back up that rhetoric with military might. Stalin and Zanadov, one of his inner circle, obtained a specially translated copy of Hitler's infamous book, Mein Kampf, and they spent hours poring over it, trying to divine the dictator's intentions. We don't need to do that. We know the future. We know that Hitler was going to invade the USSR. We know that the Nazi war machine turned out to be incredibly, devastatingly effective, and that within a year they would have overrun the entirety of Western Europe. There was no precedent for this. There was no reason to expect that they would be so astonishingly successful. After all, the First World War had begun with a German invasion of France that had started well, but then been stalled by the miracle of the Marne, and led to four years that were essentially a meat grinder stalemate. Given this, Stalin probably felt that even if Germany was in a position to invade the Soviet Union, as Hitler had declared he wanted to do, he might be tied up in the conflict in the West for years. His best move diplomatically was to ensure that Hitler targeted them first. Stalin was convinced that Germany were not going to be willing to fight another war on two fronts which had proved disastrous for them before. And so, even after the fall of France, Stalin was able to convince himself that the Nazis would not possibly consider attacking him until the British had been defeated. This would give him all the time he needed to rearm. It's also worth laying some of the blame for the pact at the feet of the Western democracies. After all, in the USSR they had a natural ally against Hitler. That's why the pact was so surprising in the first place. But the policy of appeasement, ceding more and more eastern territory to Germany, indicated to Stalin that they were not really willing to form any kind of proactive alliance to stop Hitler. Stalin, quite rightly, was convinced that they were trying to ensure that Hitler targeted the USSR first, which from the perspective of Western capitalists was two birds with one stone. And when they finally sent a delegation to negotiate, they were low-level officers. Not the foreign minister like the Germans had sent, but an unknown French general, and a British admiral who managed to forget his credentials. The admiral, who had an absurd quadruple barreled surname that I'm not even going to try and pronounce, didn't speak with the authority of the British government, and was effectively powerless to negotiate a deal or guarantee anything. Where Ribbentrop had come by private plane, the British and French had come on the slow steamboats. Another snub for Stalin, who was very unimpressed. He said, These people can't have the proper authority. London and Paris are playing poker again. End quote. Perhaps if they knew how well the negotiations were going between the Russians and the Germans, they might have put a stop to it. On the other hand, the British and French governments, with their commitment to self-determination and helping countries like Poland and the Baltic states remain independent, were unlikely to sign the kind of deal that Hitler was willing to sign, with a straight carve-up of territory that would sanction the invasion of foreign countries. We also have to consider that Stalin was always concerned with the domestic policy of the USSR above all else. Ever since the end of the 1920s and the destruction of the NEP, there had been an intense focus on maintaining internal personal control. As Robert Service points out, the reason for this is in part obvious. You see, the USSR's ideology is a little bit stuck when it comes to foreign matters, because in Marxism-Leninism, there's supposed to be some sort of external revolution that takes on the whole world. But uh, the USSR, with its radical communist ideology, it was a pariah state. It couldn't form diplomatic alliances easily with the capitalist nations. Their philosophies were just too far apart. Not when it continued to fund, via the Comintern, communist parties in other nations that were dedicated to overthrowing these governments. It was only really when Hitler came to power, and they needed the USSR as a counterweight, that they were partially rehabilitated as a buffer against the Nazis, and they were allowed, for example, into the League of Nations in 1934. Stalin's outward posture on foreign policy had always been that the USSR was dedicated to establishing socialism in one country first. But this didn't mean that there was anything except the most bellicose rhetoric in his speeches. He said, quote, We stand for peace and for the cause of peace, but we're ready to respond blow for blow to warmongers. Anyone wanting peace and business like links will always have our support. But those who try and attack our country will receive crushing retaliation to teach them not to put their pig snouts into the Soviet garden patch. That's what our foreign policy is about. End quote. 
And of course, these words went alongside the massive increase in armaments production that was part of the first and especially the second five-year plans for industrialisation. But specific means of achieving peace or defending the USSR against its enemies were not Stalin's forte. And the speech reveals that Stalin was fundamentally reactive. There's no grand plan or strategy for establishing world communism, or at least even in the early 1930s, for preventing the upcoming war that everyone feared. Stalin loved reading history, referring to the exploits of old Tsars and Russian rulers. Russia, of course, had a great history of defending itself against foreign invaders, with Napoleon's disastrous invasion of 1812, a ready historical reference on everyone's lips. Hitler himself, before Operation Barbarossa, spent a long time reading about Napoleon's campaign to try and make sure that he didn't make the same mistakes. Stalin also liked to quote the great rational, self-interested statesmen of previous generations, like Talleyrand of France. But, like nearly everyone else, he was taken aback by the speed and ferocity of the Nazi actions. It's clear that Stalin thought he'd have more time and that he could stave off the war. The Red Army had successfully invaded eastern Poland and constructed military bases in the Baltic states, in accordance with the agreement in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This was hardly a great military victory, however, as the Polish forces had been crippled by the Nazi invasion, and they likely weren't expecting to be stabbed in the back by the Russians. Indeed, some of the generals allowed the Red Army to march through Polish territory, having been told that they were going to join the struggle against the Nazis, or that they were intervening to protect Soviet populations in Poland. This kind of sounds a little bit similar to the excuse that Russia uses for intervention today. The Poles fought bravely and valiantly, but with war on two fronts, and the brutal effectiveness of the German army, this wasn't a real test of the Red Army's ability. The purges and repression, however, spread to Polish territory. In a now infamous war crime and atrocity, the NKVD massacred 22,000 army officers, members of the Polish police, and intelligentsia. They killed pilots, doctors, writers, journalists, landowners, anyone who was considered capable of helping the resistance. In the Katyn Forest in Poland. This horrific crime was blamed on the Nazis by the Soviet government until 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Only then did they admit that Stalin had personally ordered the massacre, and that Khrushchev had supervised it. Katyn was typical of the mass executions carried out by the NKVD in this time. People would be lined up in front of mass graves and shot, one by one, in the back of the neck with a pistol. There were so many victims that this would often take all day. One executioner, who was infamous as one of Stalin's most prolific hangmen, personally shot 7,000 of the victims of Katyn. To understand the scale of the horror of Katyn, imagine this man shooting one victim every three minutes for ten or more hours in a day. Then multiply that by the 28 days it took him to finish the job. You begin to understand just how awful these events were, and how cheap life was to Stalin and his secret police. All in all, in repressing Poland, a staggering 10% of the population would be deported, with many of them dying in the process. For Poland, there was no respite and no mercy in the Second World War. Despite their ruthless subjugation of Poland and the five-year plans, the Soviet military was woefully underprepared. One of the key reasons, of course, is that Stalin had just purged most of the officer corps and thrown the leadership of the army into disarray. I feel like you can't really have an understanding of why the Soviet Union was so unprepared for World War II, despite the efforts, without realising that the Great Terror had had a great impact on the armed forces. Unfortunately for Stalin, these weaknesses were to be exposed to the Nazis before they even invaded. In 1939, the USSR demanded territory from Finland, which was very close to Leningrad, around 20 miles from the border. A lot of this was old Tsarist territory that had been lost to Finland during the revolution and civil war. Now they were concerned, rightly as it turned out, that in the coming war Finland would provide a springboard for the quick capture of the key industrial city of Leningrad. The Finns refused the territorial demands of the Russians, and, after negotiations fell through, the Soviet Union invaded with five armies. Despite vastly outnumbering their Finnish opponents, the Finns fought bravely and with considerable tactical superiority. Now they didn't have any major anti-tank weapons or tank forces of their own, but the Finns were cunning and they mixed alcohol, tar and gasoline together in glass bottles that were hurled at enemy tanks. In the initial invasion, this technique managed to destroy 70 Soviet tanks. The name the Finns came up with for their improvised petrol bombs was a slap in the face to a leading Bolshevik, 
They were called Molotov cocktails. Regularly in the war we see much smaller Finnish forces, with the advantage of knowing the terrain and behaving defensively, beating back attacks from far larger Soviet armies. The Red Army's clear and callous disregard for its soldiers, with a typical attack on a fortified ridge costing over a thousand dead and 27 tanks destroyed in an hour, was revealed. I mean, they were so wasteful of resources sometimes. More troubling than this, though, were the command issues. The purge had meant that army officers had been selected for political loyalty over genuine military competence. I remember one of the first times I got interested in the politics of my own country was when I heard on the news something about a cabinet reshuffle. And this happens in the UK. And suddenly the guy who was in charge of defence was going to be in charge of transport, and the culture secretary was in charge of the health department. Since then, the education secretary has taken over and is now in charge of health. Now this baffled me for a while. I thought, surely all of these men are working in areas where they don't have any expertise. That was before I realised, of course, that the guys at the top were chosen for political loyalty more than actual relevant experience. Otherwise, the education secretary might have actually done some teaching, and the health secretary might have actually been a doctor. But I digress. In government, this is an issue that stops things from working optimally. But in war, it can be a total disaster if people don't have relative experience. One key example of this is Field Marshal Kulik. He was over-promoted by Stalin, who personally trusted him. Uh, they'd fought alongside each other in the Civil War. They were good friends. Stalin put Kulik in charge of the artillery, because he'd been an artillery commander under him in the Civil War. Even though this was a much smaller job, the personal loyalty was important to Stalin. And Kulik made plenty of mistakes. In the age of Blitzkrieg, as German panzer tanks were destroying everything in their path and revealing the importance of mechanised warfare, Kulik insisted that tanks are a fad. He believed that tanks would never truly replace horses. He's reported as saying, quote, What the hell do we need rocket artillery for? The main thing is the horse-drawn gun. End quote. His anti-tank bias meant that he delayed production of the Soviet T-34 tanks, which were eventually the best tanks of the war. While forward-thinking officers like Tukhachevsky were being persecuted, men like Kulik, who were hopelessly stuck in 1918, were being promoted purely due to their personal loyalty to Stalin. And it's a vicious cycle too, because if you're saying something that Stalin agrees with, then you might get promoted, and he's less likely to listen to alternative opinions. So if your beliefs contradict his, then in fact you're less likely to have them listened to under this kind of system. In fact, it seems as if the purge broke the Red Army particularly badly. Tukhachevsky and his associates, who were most persecuted by the NKVD, well, they were the forward-thinking group that emphasised embracing modern warfare, while Kulik and his cavalry-loving mob were largely left alone or promoted. And it, it, it's odd, in a way, that Stalin didn't realise that Kulik's ideas were terrible, because he was constantly going on about how Russia was being beaten for backwardness, and then to listen to this man who said that tanks weren't going to be a thing. It just seems ridiculous to me. But... The Red Army had also drawn up plans that predicted precisely where the invasion was likely to come. These plans proved to be correct, but Stalin disagreed with them, and the general defensive strategy of the USSR was subject to his meddling. It's fair to point out that actually, the later stages of the war, this trend reversed. Stalin delegated more and more military command to his trusted subordinates as he started to win, and Hitler took a greater personal control over his operations. And such is the way with the dictators. Yet it led to the classic observation that two of the greatest armies in world history were in the hands of military amateurs during the Second World War. Without getting too far into military hardware geek specifics, it's obvious that Stalin's purges were having an impact on high command. Not just in terms of the talent that had been lost, but in terms of what the people who were left felt they could do. People were deathly afraid to report failures or concerns with battle plans to higher-ups, because you might get accused of being a saboteur or a defeatist. Many of the commanders of the army were political commissars with no real military experience. But if you disagreed with them, it could mean your death. Stalin's paranoia and eager willingness to purge the army, even during wartime, was not abated. His constant conviction that failures were due to treachery rather than military reality, his own mistakes, bad tactics or a poorly equipped army, meant that purges continued throughout the war. Consequently, countless terrible decisions were being made by the Red Army, at a shocking human and military cost 
and with no hope that they could be corrected by the officers that remained who had some reasonable experience. These problems would be magnified a hundredfold when the Nazis invaded. Stalin himself would later admit that the army performed badly in the winter war against Finland. Eventually, the overwhelming numbers of the Red Army prevailed, and the Finns negotiated a peace treaty where they ceded some territory. But the Red Army had really been embarrassed on the world stage. One of his key subordinates, Voroshilov, in a bitter shouting round during the war, hit the nail on the head. He said, You have yourself to blame for all of this. You're the one who annihilated the old guard of the army. You had all our best generals killed. Voroshilov, who had personally signed 185 death lists and denounced many of his fellow officers, was being a tiny bit hypocritical here. It was probably only his status as a Politburo member that protected him. Unfortunately, this was one of the few times that Stalin's comrades were willing to be honest with him. But Stalin did begin to take criticism on board, and over 11,000 officers who had been arrested under the purges were freed and returned to military service. Which creates another set of the uniquely tragic human stories that a dictator like Stalin generates, when every little whim he has gets enacted into reality. Imagine being an officer like Konstantin Rokossovsky. He was a brilliant officer, who masterminded one of the Red Army's biggest successes. But he was Polish-born. He must have known how Stalin had devastated his native land. What's more, Rokossovsky had been personally persecuted by the NKVD. His wife and daughter had been exiled. He'd been tortured in prison for three years. Twice while he was in jail, he was taken out with no warning in the middle of the night and subjected to a mock execution. When he first met Stalin after his ordeal and his sudden mysterious release, Stalin noticed that he had no fingernails the work of his torturers. Rokossovsky later told his daughter that the reason he always carried a pistol was that he would not surrender alive if they came to arrest him again. Yet this man was instrumental in some of the key Red Army successes. He served Stalin loyally. But how can you possibly have an army based on trust and loyalty when this is the kind of historical weight that hangs over people? Yet the biggest failure that arose from the culture of terror surrounding Stalin was his astounding failure to anticipate the Nazi invasion. I mean, massing the forces that Hitler did, that's not easy to hide. Stalin's intelligence network was actually rather sophisticated. This same group of individuals in 1940 pulled off the coup that he'd been waiting for. On the 20th of August in 1940, Trotsky, in his endless, hopeless exile in Mexico, invited a Spanish communist, Ramon Mercado, to visit him. Although he'd been hunted for years, Trotsky was still coordinating various international communist groups that denounced Stalin and worked towards a true revolution. He was a dedicated Marxist to the end. His utopian fantasies of the socialist paradise were not diminished by the reality of a Bolshevik seizure of power. Russia, Trotsky had decided, was declared a special case because the peasants were not true Bolsheviks and did not want socialism. So Trotsky was coordinating this meeting with Kada. He looked down at the article that Makada had brought him and Mercado pulled an ice pick out from his jacket and drove it through Trotsky's skull. He was not killed instantly, but Trotsky died shortly afterwards, saying, Stalin has finished the job that he started. And it was not just in distant Mexico that Stalin could make his power felt. There were communist sympathisers throughout Europe and the world, and plenty of anti-Nazi elements who were willing to help the USSR. But Stalin did not trust his security services. He was endlessly paranoid. He didn't let other members of the government and the Politburo access to the information from his spy network. And he didn't trust the spy network itself. He didn't allow the members of the army to see the intelligence reports even. In just the same way as failure on the part of industrialists was sabotage, any information that conflicted with Stalin's worldview was all too often dismissed as trickery from the British or provocations by Hitler to justify war. Fake news. Stalin himself seemed amazingly willing to trust Hitler, a statesman who had reneged on every single previous deal he'd ever struck with a foreign government or with politicians in his own country. When at a meeting, the brilliant General Zukov, about whom we'll have a lot more to say, asked Stalin whether defences along the western frontier should be bolstered. Stalin reassured him. Stalin said, Our ambassador had a serious conversation with Hitler personally, and Hitler said to him, Please don't worry about the concentration of our forces in Poland. Our forces are retraining. End quote. <laughs> Stalin may not have believed this, 
But the fact that he'd make excuses for defending the Western Frontier as late as 1940, only a year before the invasion, is shocking. British attempts to warn him about the date of the invasion were similarly rebuffed. He was still convinced that the British were trying to play the Nazis and the USSR off against each other. But even Stalin's own intelligence network did not fail him. He had plenty of indication that the Nazi invasion was coming, down to the exact date of the invasion itself. But when Zhukov and Timoshenko, key Red Army generals, told him about the array of information that was available, suggesting the invasion was imminent, Stalin threw the documents back in their faces, saying, I have different documents. He was burying his head in the sand and living in a world of alternative facts at the start of 1941. Hitler had moved only the three million troops close to the border, and even begun aerial reconnaissance flights over Russian territory that Stalin knew about. He dismissed them as provocations. Then, a Nazi deserter with communist sympathies defected, and gave them the plans of the invasion. He was followed by two more, one of whom swam a river to report to Stalin that the order to invade had already been issued. Stalin ordered that the deserters be arrested, interrogated, and shot for spreading disinformation. It's gratitude for you. So why was Stalin so willing to deny all of the evidence? It's hard to say. He was convinced that the USSR wouldn't be ready for war until 1943. And so maybe it was a degree of wishful thinking. He was hoping that he could diplomatically prolong the peace. And it seemed like he was constantly seeking reassurance from his historical readings and his subordinates that he was correct in his assessment of the situation. He was trying to convince himself that he was right. And... Maybe he just felt that he couldn't back down. He probably failed to adapt to how quickly the Nazis had dispatched with France. Within six weeks, France and the Benelux countries had been completely taken over, which no one anticipated, probably not even the Nazis. Having spent so long insisting on this delaying strategy, maybe he felt it was a sign of weak leadership to change his mind. Did he genuinely have an unshakable personal conviction that he'd outsmarted Hitler? It goes against everything we know of Stalin's suspicious and manipulative nature, and he's an intelligent man. To think that he would genuinely trust Hitler, one of the least trustworthy figures in history. In later years he would say that he tried to put himself into the mind of the other person and made a terrible mistake. But his failure to anticipate the invasion of 1941 was one of the most dramatic episodes of his reign, and it nearly cost him everything. The night of 21st of June, 1941, began like any other night. Stalin reassured his inner circle of his conviction that Hitler would not invade. The sycophantic and rather disgusting Berrier called it a wise prediction. At 3.15 that morning, the initial German bombardment started. The Luftwaffe bombed key cities along the border, and the artillery bombarded the Soviet defences. Three million soldiers, 3,600 tanks, 600,000 vehicles and 2,500 aircraft surged across the border in the largest invasion in military history. The war that would determine the fate of the world had begun. The initial reaction of Stalin and his inner circle to the invasion is a perfect, tragicomic illustration of everything that had gone wrong in the build-up to the war. There was an immediate flurry of phone calls between key Red Army figures like Zhukov and Timoshenko. They were terrified of the invasion, but they were more terrified of who was going to call Stalin and tell him that the invasion had begun. This incident seems to have descended into complete farce. Each of them tried to call the front line, which was in absolute chaos. The initial orders were, don't react. Even ordering a counter-attack or defensive manoeuvres was too much for them to do without Stalin's say-so. Timoshenko, amazingly, told his underlings who were telling him about the situation of the invasion to report to me in writing before he was willing to call Stalin. He was afraid that if this turned out to be false, and the army was purged as a result, he'd be executed. Having a nice written report meant that he could blame someone else. All the while, Stalin was asleep. He slept for over two hours before Zhukov called him and reported the invasion. Just a few weeks ago, Stalin had yelled at Zhukov, quote, What are you about? Do you really want a war? Haven't you got enough medals and titles? End quote. Now Zhukov was the only one brave enough to tell Stalin the news. Apparently, when he told Stalin that he was wrong, that the invasion had come, he just heard Stalin's breathing down the phone for the first minute or so, before he summoned his generals and political allies to a meeting. 
even then as the Luftwaffe bombers were pounding the Russian cities. Stalin still remained convinced that Hitler can't possibly know about it. That scoundrel Ribbentrop, he's the one who's tricked us. Stalin issued absurd orders telling the Russian troops not to cross the border into German territory in case this was a provocation. This order was both politically and militarily ludicrous. The scale of the defeat in the initial invasion was massive. The Red Army would not see that border for years to come. So stunned was Stalin by the war that he gave the task of announcing it to the Soviet people to Molotov, the man whose pact had just been tossed aside. Molotov later recalled, quote, He didn't want to be the first to speak. He couldn't respond like a robot to everything. He was a human being, after all. End quote. Molotov delivers this speech on the radio, but it's not just a standard Soviet propaganda speech. They already start referring to it as the Great Patriotic War. Perhaps Stalin sensed that the loyalty to the ideals of communism would be less powerful than love of country and desire to defend homeland against foreign invaders. That would inspire more people to action than defending communism against fascism. Maybe that was the only calculation got right in the early days. For the first day or two, Perhaps Stalin oscillated between panic and optimism, in the way people tend to do when they don't have enough information, or when new information has just started to sink in. When Stalin would realise what had happened, the scale of the defeat on the front, he was unable to process it. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email at us at autocracynow at outlook.com, follow us on Twitter, like the page on Facebook. Please leave a rating or review on iTunes or your favourite podcast share. That way I don't have to throw paper airplane flyers from the top of the Empire State Building, which is inefficient and impractical and expensive advertising given that I don't live in New York. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, and be kind to one another. Next time, I will discuss the full scale and consequences of Stalin's miscalculation, which surely has to rank alongside the worst military defeats in history. I am going to try to avoid the very serious risk of giving you a full blow-by-blow account of the Eastern Front of the Second World War partly because other people have done it far better than I can ever hope to, and partly because this is not a World War II podcast. I'm going to try and keep the focus on Stalin, but even so, there's going to be a lot of military history. And I'll talk about one of the strangest episodes in Stalin's life, one that remains mysterious to this day. See you then.